Hello and welcome to the Qubit Guy podcast, brought to you by Classic, the quantum algorithm design company. My name is Yuval, and my guest today is Olivier Ezrati, a prolific author and consultant. Olivier and I speak about the risk and rewards of hype in quantum, the difference between the German and French quantum ecosystems, full-stack vendors, and more. We hope you enjoy this episode. Please let us know how we did by emailing hello at classic.io. That's hello at classic.io. Hello, Olivier, and thanks for joining me today. Hello, Yuval. So who are you and what do you do? Uh, I'm Olivier Zrati, so I'm a freelance technology uh, consultant and analyst, and I'm specialized in quantum tech, and I've been doing this for about four years now. So you have a book that I think now is in the fourth edition, am I correct? Yes, it's an 836-pages book. It's free to download as a PDF, but you can also uh, buy a paperback edition on Amazon in two volumes, and it covers about anything on quantum tech, I mean, uh, from science to technology, even uh, geopolitics and ethics, social issues, whatever. Wow. So right now it has more pages than, than we have qubits. So, uh, but maybe uh, yes. qubits are catching yeah. up, right? Well, it depends if you take into account G-Wave, but... <laughs> yes. Yes. And then you also have a podcast and you recently published uh, a paper, a sci- almost an academic paper on quantum hype. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. A couple so of weeks tell ago. tell me about it. What... Uh, what was the thesis in the paper and what did you find? Well, first, uh, why did I write that? Uh, I started to think about it when I met uh, with a couple uh, corporate customers who were starting to worry about this hype and they were worried that it could be very similar to the artificial intelligence hype from the late 80s, early 90s. And they told me, which was really worrying, that if they were not able to deliver, I mean, a substantial improvement with uh, uh, algorithms and uh, actual hardware, um, some customers would, would pull the plug on all the quantum investments. So I, I was willing to understand what was behind this hype, um, what were its different aspects, and how was it different from the various technology hubs that we've, we've seen for the last uh, three decades. And I found out some similarities, but also a lot of difference. Um, Maybe I can elaborate as you like. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I found out is uh, there's a kind of bipolar uh, hype. You've got a significant overhype in quantum computing, but on the other hand, you've got an underhype phenomenon with other fields like quantum sensing. It, it makes a big difference. And I think that uh, probably we, we should talk more about quantum sensing, which is more ready, uh, higher TRLs, a lot of use cases in various industries. So it could balance the field uh, with quantum computing. Well, the, the, the quantum computing hype started a while ago, probably with the Peter Shor's algorithm. Uh, back, so it's a long time ago, 20, 28 years ago. Then you had the quantum supremacy three years ago. Uh, then the, the big chunks of large startups fundings. I mean, the Psi Quantum, INQ, Rigetti, and now you've got the D-Wave SPAC. And then on top of that, you had all the quantum investment plans from most governments, I would say, uh, uh, US, China, Russia, Israel, France, Germany, UK, uh, Singapore. Uh, all these countries have a, a significant uh, quantum plan. And all this mixed together cre- creates the hype. And what's very uh, interesting is what comes out of the analyst and the consultant uh, scene with those crazy uh, market forecasts, uh, sometimes confusing the... I mean, the, the, the created value and the real addressable market. You've got uh, Boston Consulting Group and uh, McKinsey, who talks about $1 trillion market, which is just value generated with customers, but it's not the market for hardware, software, and services. So this is creating a big confusion. And on top of that, so where are the differences? Uh, the differences with other hypes, like the ones we have right now on uh, cryptocurrencies or NFTs and Web3 and so on, is the science is very different. Uh, we've got a very low uh, technology readiness level, even for startups. Uh, I would say it's more or less n- similar to nuclear fusion, very low trials. Uh, I have never seen such high um, uh, scientific uncertainty and also confusion 
uh, because it's very hard to evaluate the technology. If I was a customer, I would have a very hard time to figure out which kind of computer could I use to do what, with what kind of performance, what kind of benchmark could I rely on to compare solutions. How do I compare uh, quantum annealing, uh, quantum simulation, and gate-based quantum computing? It's really hard to evaluate the, the, the current scene. But on the other hand, what I would say is where well, the science is strong, even though it's not perfect, uh, we don't have such high investments. Uh, even though Psy Quantum raised more than 700 million bucks, it's not that much. I mean, if you look at the total uh, investments in the quantum started, startup scene, it's less than 5 billion. 5 billion is pocket money. I mean, we'd compare it with the 625 billion money that was poured into startups last year. It's nothing. It's, it's nothing compared to the, uh, I mean, the, the, the business benefit that could be uh, created by, by the whole quantum field. So all in all, it's not that bad, I would say. Um, but it has a lot of consequences. Uh, the, 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 the quantum scene is really changing everything. It's changing the way uh, public research is being conveyed. Um, you have so, so much fight for uh, public funding and uh, private funding that it creates a lot of competition between both fields. Um, uh, this com in some cases, you have bigger uh, research teams, fundamental research teams in the, um, in the vendor space than in the public sector space, even in the US. When you look at the number of people who work at PsyQuantum, even IBM, uh, it's hundreds of people. It's more than any lab, uh, even in, at the MIT, Harvard, uh, Princeton, uh, um, the Maryland University, it's, it's more. So we have a fairly new situation uh, that's uh, part of a, some kind of bubble. Um, so they, it's, it's creating a, a, new, a new situation. So then what do we do? That's the question. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's decompose this a little bit. Yep. First, um, hype is not entirely bad, right? Because I think that you're making the case that hype encourages research, hype encourages students to go into the field, hype encourages investments. So some level of hype, we can argue whether it's too much or too little, is a good thing. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think there's always been some hype in most of the technology waves and even those who did succeed. The danger is after the hype. If you have some overhype at some point and you've got this uh, through of de disillusion, and if the disillusion is too big, too large, then it can stop the, the funding uh, for public research. It can stop the funding even in the private sector. So that's the danger. So if you have a, a too big a gap between the uh, ex expectations from the market and from everybody, every uh, stakeholder and what can be actually delivered, and it's not, it's not a problem of perception. It's not a problem of marketing. It's a problem of science reality. If you've got too large a gap, then you are in trouble. That's what happened twice with AI. It happened in the 70s, then in the, then in the 80s and uh, 90s. So I think we should avoid that. So we should probably lower a little bit the tone of the hype and make sure that we deliver. Uh, make sure that uh, some safe bait are done on one hand, make sure that people, all stakeholders understand that we are in a very long-term uh, scientific journey. Uh, we won't have scalable quantum computing in five years, whatever people say. Uh, it will take a long time. Uh, we have to make a lot of efforts to deliver uh, actual uh, quantum advantages with the NISC uh, hardware and uh, the related software and tools. So, we should soften a little bit the tone, probably. Uh, we should probably also have more engagement and involvement of scientists in the debate. It should be more visible. Uh, we should maybe have some debate between the skeptics and the, the, the optimists in that field. Um, that's, that's the thing. And probably everything is about how do you implement a so-called uh, responsible innovation process. So how do you make sure that all the stakeholders are responsible in their behavior, starting with uh, the vendors? So some change is, is, is required, I, I would say. 
I think Bill Gates said that revolutions take longer than you think, and then they are bigger than you think. So of course, when yeah. you when you put it in historical perspective, and I mean, we see the potential of quantum, right? And if you have systems with 100 qubits, I think it's believable that you will have 200 and 400 and 800 and, and so on and so on. It just might take a little bit more time. In your opinion, how long before quantum becomes something that's not just research and hype and becomes truly useful? Well, that's a $100 question we, we always hear. Uh, I, the honest re response is to say, I have no idea, because it's so complicated. I mean, it's, it's about how do you create an entangled state of, uh, with a large number of quantum objects? Nobody, know if it, nobody knows if it's possible. The theory says yes, um, probably more the mathematical theory than the, the real uh, quantum theory. So it's not that easy. It's not that easy to move from 10 to 100 and 100 to several hundreds and thousands, because it's about controlling uh, an n-body uh, uh, system, uh, and this is far far from being easy, whatever the tools you use. What I believe is we probably will have some surprises from original uh, architectures. Uh, for example, I, I don't believe a lot in the scalability of superconducting qubits. I think we may have some surprises from photonic uh, qubits, maybe from silicon qubits, maybe from very um, uh, strange architecture based on topological qubit, even though the Microsoft path uh, seems in bad shape right now. Um, I believe we may have surprises from original uh, solutions. Typically, the measurement-based quantum computing uh, solution with photonic uh, system may be interesting. Um, but so far, we don't have the proofs. Uh, so we have to be very open. That's why we, we can't make a bet of what's going to be the, the winning uh, hardware uh, architecture. Earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that your book also covers geopolitics. And we've seen large government investments, maybe not huge, but still, you know, um, two billion here, five billion there, three billion there. Soon enough, you get to real money, as they say. Mm. Do you think all these governments are wrong in investing? Or do you think they look at what will it cost to invest and what might the cost be if we don't invest and we don't have quantum technology? What what do you think is behind all these investments? Yeah, the, what's behind is the uh, the quest for sovereignty, technology sovereignty. The, the goals are different from one country to the other. I'd say that for the large countries like um, uh, China, the US, and even to, to some extent Russia, it's about uh, controlling uh, the fate of their information systems. Uh, it's about uh, the potential to control uh, cybersecurity uh, that makes it an attractive position. I'd say that the European position is a bit different. Uh, I, I don't expect the European countries to, uh, I mean, to be willing to control the cyberspace as maybe the Chinese and uh, the Americans would like to do. Uh, but Europe is willing to, to bet that a new technology revolution is a, an opportunity uh, not to lose again against the Americans. I mean, uh, I mean so much technology is being controlled by uh, large American companies, uh, from Intel to IBM to Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and others. Um, and Chinese for manufacturing and Taiwan, Taiwan for semiconductor production. So Europe wants to have its, its, its fair share of a new cake. And since there is a, a huge uncertainty in the science field uh, to create the cake, they say, hey, why not us as well? Um, so the rationale is a bit different. And the other countries, I would say Israel, uh, Netherlands, uh, Singapore, they also want to be a player. They, they know they will never be as big as the US. Uh, and they want to be part of this new ecosystem that's, that's being built. Now, in Europe, there are investments on multiple levels, right? There are investments at the EU level. Yes. And I had, the, um, <clears throat> uh, I had Oscar, the responsible for quantum at the EU, uh, on this podcast. Um, how is the French ecosystem different, in your opinion, than the German ecosystem? Because on one hand, in Germany, there are a lot of industrial companies that are doing quantum, you know, BMW and others, and, and certainly also Fraunhofer Institute and many academic organizations. In France, there seems to be a hub of uh, quantum activity in Paris. How would you compare the French and German 
approach to quantum. Well, well in France, you have many hubs, uh, a bit like Germany. I mean, uh, Germany, you've got Munich, you've got um, you've got Dresden, there are many, many Hanover, or Berlin, you've got many places, um, even uh, around um, Stuttgart with the IBM site and uh, Fraunhofer. So in France, we have at least three main hubs. It's Paris, Saclay, near Paris, and then Grenoble with a huge uh, track around the Silicon Qubit. And then you've got Bordeaux, Strasbourg, Toulouse, Nice, many, many different places. Well, the, the difference with Germany, I would say, it is twofold. One is, surprisingly, you have more hardware startup in France than in Germany. You would expect, given the tr manufacturing tradition of Germany, to have more hardware startups there. And actually, in France, we have already five startups in uh, quantum computing hardware, uh, like Pascal, Alice and Bob, uh, C12, uh, you've got Candela, you're going to have soon a new one on Silicon Qubit. So it's five. In Germany, I don't know, we've got maybe only two and one just um, went bankrupt. So, And they have more, uh, more startups in the, um, in the software scene. And upside down, the large corporations uh, ecosystem is more dynamic in Germany on the demand side. So we've got all the automotive industry, all the pharmaceutical industry, some part of the financial industry that looks to be more dynamic in, in Germany than in France or even in the UK. So th that's, I, I would rate that. And when you look at research, fundamental research coming from public research labs, we have a lot more funding in Germany than in France. But there are some teamworks happening. So some teams in France team up with German teams um, in various fields. Um, there's, for example, one partnership that, that has been launched on a, a creating a hybrid computing platform, um, uh, teaming up with uh, Pascal, the quantum simulation startup. So Julich uh, on one end, uh, the Julich Supercomputing Center on one end in Germany, and uh, its equivalent at the CEA in the Paris region are teaming up on that with the, the European Commission. So... We, we have to team up whatever happens. That's the lesson. Because Europe as a fragmented region can't compete efficiently with the US or China. So that's why we need uh, more partnerships within Europe. Uh, we, we recently have a, a very very interesting situation with a software company from the Netherlands called Q&Co that was acquired by Pascal in France. Um, or there was, it's a kind of an m and And now we have a, a larger company um, it's not as big as the merger between HQS and, and CQC in the UK, uh, but still it's interesting to have uh, some European companies that um, are merging together. So actually, let's talk about that, the hardware and software companies that are merging together. You mentioned that there are different, many different modalities of hardware, and we don't know exactly who will be the winner. So yes. is it wise for customers to go to a monolithic vendor that says we have everything, hardware and software and applications? Or would your recommendation typically be to select the best of breed in every uh, every part of the technology stack? Well, right now there is a lot of uh, vertical integration. I mean, most of the large vendors want to have the full stack solution. IBM is one example. Even D-Wave is entirely full stack. Um, so the trend is being full stack. Probably being full stack is a tradition with emerging markets. And when the market gets consolidated, somebody like Microsoft or Intel or Android uh, with Google in the smartphone space is uh, horizontalizing the market. Right now, we are more in a verticalization uh, approach. And so if we take the case of uh, Q&Co and, and, and Pascal, it maybe makes a lot more sense than for IBM and others. The reason is... The software ecosystem for quantum simulation is not that mature. I mean, you have much fewer software vendors working on quantum simulation than on gate-based quantum computing. So it makes sense when you are in a more, uh, uh, I would say, in a, uh, a more uh, anecdotic or less used hardware platform. It makes it makes sense to be vertically integrated. Um, but hopefully. Uh, this kind of company, I mean, those guys doing quantum simulation, they would love to have more software vendors working on their platform. But when it's small, they have to start with uh, their own platform. So that's why the acquisition made sense. So if you were a master of the quantum universe and you all of a sudden are not 
just monitoring, but now you control everything. Yep. What would you want us technology vendors to be working on between now and say the end of 2023? Oh, well, first I would like to have a larger projects, like a kind of Manhattan project with a larger teams, more coordination. I would love also to have more coordination around the enabling technologies. Uh, if you take uh, semiconductor qubits, I mean, uh, whether it's a uh, silicon qubit or, or superconducting qubit, you need more uh, joint work on the um, uh, enabling technologies like cryoelectronics. Um, you need also to have some work uh, being done on, on the energetics. I mean, myself involved in such a project uh, with my friend Alexia Ofev from Grenoble. Uh, we, we need to have more efforts that are transversal to all the, the track. I would also like to have a, a, a more joint work between, between all the vendors on benchmarking. So far, I see the, the, the competition is so hard and also the obfuscation of the real capacities of existing qubits that there's no accepted benchmark uh, that's used everywhere. Uh, it's very hard to figure out what are the real performance of each and every uh, hardware solution. So I would love to have more collaboration. And that's co a contradiction because there's a contradiction between the usual uh, 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 collaboration and open source uh, attitude that you have in public research and the fact that now there's a lot of research being conducted in the, in the private sector. So we have to manage at some point this contradiction. Olivier, how can people get in touch with you to learn more about your research? Well, in all my books and all my papers, my email and even my phone is indicated, so I'm very easy to join. You can Google me, uh, you find everything. <laughs> I, I'm easy. I'm easy to find. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Yuval.